Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Moms Making Money Show. I have a super special guest coming to us from tomorrow. And by tomorrow, I mean she's in Australia, so it's already Sunday there. And it's still Saturday here in California. So um, so I think that's kind of cool that not only are we super international and intercontinental, but we are, you know, breaking the calendar barrier as well. Um, Today I have the lovely Barbara Orban with me. She is an intuitive eating coach and I've actually done some work with her myself and I find her to be so amazing, so inspirational and so much fun. So the cool thing about her business is, um, so if you guys have your questions, feel free to pop those in here when you're hopping on live. And if you're catching the replay, be sure to type in replay. But the cool thing about what she teaches us is that you basically still get to eat whatever you want and you can still like get a lean, healthy body. So um, she's also been able to make that helping women. You pretty much work with only women, yeah, for the most part? For the most part, yeah. Yeah, okay. for the most part, just because it's really close to my heart, I guess, like the issues that women's women face yeah so with that being said she's been able to turn her passion for that and i know that she has a long history of all of the science behind nutrition and exercise and everything um so it's not like she just you know woke up one day and decided she's actually been actively involved in the science and the history of this for many many years um but she's out there changing life you guys so she decided to make this into a business and she started to find seriously good success and I'm gonna actually turn it over to Barbara and have her just give us a little bit of insight on what actually made her decide to take that first step and making her yes for many many years now um, due to my own issues and struggles with it all um, so I really dived into a lot of that and learning so much as much as I could and I think for many, many years I wanted to start a business in the fitness and health field, um, but not really having the confidence to do it, not really believing in myself. Um, and I think it all ties in together with, with everything that I was struggling with kind of in my early 20s and things like that. So definitely um, like I had a history with a lot of yo-yo dieting, a lot of fad diets, always trying to lose weight, always feeling guilty around food, um, always hopping onto the latest trends and fads and things like, you know, at the time when I was in my early 20s, it was the Atkins um, and cutting out carbohydrates, having a really high protein. And then I tried shakes and <laughs> I've tried everything, basically. You, you name it, I've tried it. And um, then I discovered the world of intuitive eating, learning about emotions and how they um, interact with our behaviours and eating and healing the relationship with food. And so really that's what led me down this path where I just felt like women didn't know enough from a holistic perspective of how to take care of themselves and manage their weight. And so that's really where the idea of my business came uh, because I felt like that information wasn't available to me. So I feel this really strong pull and need to provide that information to others uh, because I went through so much unnecessary suffering not having this information available to me. So I, it's, it's such an emotional topic for me and um, being able to provide that assistance and help to others means a lot to me, um, just kind of filling some sort of a purpose, I guess. <laughs> no, that's, that's so awesome. And, you know, especially because it's like one of the things that you'd mentioned is that so many people, they're just, they really don't know. And, and marketing in in the new, you know, quote unquote, nutrition world is so misleading. You know, like mm -hmm. I remember um, my sister came over one day and she was so excited that she had found such a bargain on all these special K bars. And I was mm -hmm. like, oh, OK, well, why would you buy those? She's like, because they're so healthy. And like, you know, yeah. she's like, they saw in this commercial and she was going on and on about it because she at that time had she, you know, not that I have anything against special K bars, but I just don't feel like they are. They're, they're, 
they're a little misleading in that they're still marketing. Yeah. <laughs> sugar and stuff, but you think of them as like a whole grain cereal bar type of thing. And so you're thinking, oh, this is perfect. I can, it's, you know, it's good for you because that's what they say on the commercial. That's, <laughs> that's what it says on the box. It's low fat. It's low this. It's blah, blah, blah. You know, and I feel like, I feel like, especially, I, especially in the U.S., like, I don't know about how it is in Australia. Um, I know, like, the U.K. has a lot of stricter guidelines with, you know, nutrition and labeling and that kind of stuff. But here, it's, it's, it can be, being a certified nutritionist myself, I get discouraged and I get frustrated because I see the way things are labeled and it's very misleading. Uh, I'm, I'm in the same boat. It's, it's, I feel the same way here in Australia. Definitely, I'm constantly telling people to not look at the marketing and to look at the ingredients and the nutritional label because um, it's just not about what's written on there. I basically ignore anything that's written <laughs> as as marketing or advertising on anything because you just can't, in, in Australia as well, you just can't trust. Um, you just got to understand how to read labels. Yeah. Right, right. And I know and a lot of a lot. I've got it. I've got it. A lot of people get misled because of convenience. Yeah. Just, just the fact of that. And, um, and, and when you're busy, and a lot of people are busy, that can be a huge factor in making that eating decision. So, um, so I know that's hard for a lot of women. But when you were first kind of getting back to business, we'll get into all of the details of um, of your actual business here shortly. But getting but back to something else, when you first started your business, what kind of struggles did you have from like a business perspective? Um, you know, like any self doubts or fears or people telling you like, don't do this or. Definitely, oh, from every angle, like all of what you just said. <laughs> um, so definitely like just, I guess overwhelm and confusion, like where to begin, um, lots of information on where to get started. Um, definitely like a confidence thing. Um, and I think that this, that kind of situation is like a continuing thing. Um, like I don't think there's ever an end point with having to manage emotions around a business. Like there's always going to be things coming up. And so it's not, necessarily about not having those fears and doubts and things like that but just having an awareness of them and knowing how to manage them um so definitely stuff comes up and there was definitely you know in the beginning overcoming the self-doubt takes a lot of I guess like that that developing a kind of a self-talk mm -hmm. um, so it's funny because it's similar to what I did for myself with my dieting, um, which I talk about a lot. And, yeah, just having that self-talk, having that encouraging voice for yourself, I think that's always helped me building my confidence because a lot of the time, like, we're all going to have that mental chatter. Like, I mean, oh, yeah. <laughs> you can relate, right? Like, I don't know anyone, no matter how famous or – um, like big they are, successful they are in business, we all have that negative chatter. And so learning to manage that and the way that I manage it is really just to talk, talk in a line coving light kind. <laughs> I've got a bit of a mix up of words. Um, kind, loving voice to myself um, right. to kind of encourage myself, you know, because those thoughts aren't real. A lot of the time women... Um, take these thoughts of I'm not good enough or um, I'm not smart enough or I don't, my message isn't good enough or whatever, I don't know, whatever doubts are coming up about starting a business. Um, yeah, and then yeah. they take it as the, the truth. Um, and just having an understanding of psychology and how the brain works and things like that and just knowing that those thoughts aren't reality, they're not a representation of who you are. Um, and so you can just shift that. <laughs> right, right, right. And it's, it is all going on because it doesn't matter what, like you're saying, it doesn't matter what phase of your business you're in. It doesn't matter what phase of your weight loss or health journey you're in. Because even once you say you lose 20 pounds, 
and then you just get into like, okay, this is my goal weight, then there's like still maintenance, right? Like, so it's the same thing in your business that once you get through some of those harder obstacles, then there's still, then there's still there's always like, you know, like, you know, we talked about, we may have a technical difficulty here or there with a glitch or, you know, a camera shutter or, or something that just, or a kid barging through the door and turning the office upside down. That happens. Don't happen. talking. <laughs> But, but even though even those, though those happen, we have to, you know, like you said, talk gently and kindly to ourselves and realize that it's still going to be okay. Everything's going to be great. So um, one cool thing too that I think is neat that, that you do with your business, I'd love to dive into it a little bit and kind of, I mean, obviously there's no possible way that we could really cover everything in, you know, this episode, but maybe give us just like a few little like, like tips or takeaways for your biggest thing. Like when you talk to people about what you do, tell us, you know, like teach us what it means to be an intuitive eater, I guess. Yeah. So I guess being an intuitive eater compared to what I used to be like kind of feels like, when, when, like you were talking about before, like when you lose weight, I just feel like that's half the battle. Yeah. Or maybe yeah. even like a quarter of the battle. Honestly, I think the real battle lies in keeping it off um, yeah. Yeah. from my perspective. And what I've witnessed, and I guess with my kind of like observations of the last 10, 15 years of dieting of myself and watching other women, um, is that it's that whole trend of having it a lifestyle becomes not a lifestyle but dieting <laughs> to like it's kind of like walking on eggshells you're constantly thinking about how not to gain the weight back or how to lose weight so it's something that's constantly on your mind yeah. and i just don't believe that that's healthy or how we're necessarily meant to live um right. and i think that there's one thing to be healthy and then it's another thing to avoid going out with friends or avoid eating out or avoid eating certain foods or like having a slice of birthday cake for a special occasion or things like that. So I think it's important to have a balance in life. And I want to kind of break that um, belief that you can't be both, that you can't be healthy, that you can't have balance and have the body you want. I just right. think that you can have it all. Um, and and it's so much focused on like having that holistic approach and understanding for me, the biggest thing was understanding how the brain works and how it influences your body because a lot of people forget that the brain is connected to our body. So therefore your brain is actually governing a lot of your biological processes. Right. Um, so that's really, really key here because that having understood the body and studied it as much as I have, like I now just have this completely different understanding of how much your thoughts influence the actual biochemistry of the body and how things take place. So it's yes. really amazing stuff. <laughs> so popping on. Says hi. Hi, Julie. Hello. Hi, Julie. <laughs> Feel free to hit us with some of your questions if you have any questions about, about yeah definitely and basically um still being able to live your life eat the foods that you enjoy and lose weight and be healthy like overall that's what's important is that you are able to maintain health through all of this exactly. and i know one thing that we talked about so i'm going to kind of tell on myself a little bit is um and you probably see this in your journey quite a bit is women like me who feel like, or not so much feel like, but at some point, like, I'll do that after. Like, I'll do the healthy eating after. I'll take care of myself after. I'll do the self-care stuff after. After I take care of the kids. After I'm successful in my business. After, 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 after all the afters, right? Mm -hmm. Do you have any, like, any words of wisdom that, because I know when we come down, we're like, if you take care of yourself first, your business is going to be better. Your relationships are going to be better. You're going to feel, you know, more energized and have more fun playing with your kids because you feel better. So mm -hmm. that's why I kind of stress the whole thing about like um, intuitive eating and self-care and whatever, because after we had that conversation, it like sat with me for a minute and I was like, 
yeah, she's totally right that like if I'm forcing all these things and not taking not time to like fill that pleasure that tank of my own, 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 then everything, then everything instead so, of everything just flowing and being fun and being light and and then you know so I don't do you have any like absolutely any on that? <laughs> oh my god, I've got loads. <laughs> <laughs> you won't be able to shut me up. No. <laughs> so I think like this is something that we all struggle with. Like I have to sometimes kind of say, you know, am I looking after myself first? And I think a lot of the times we, like when I was talking to you about it as well, like there's a great analogy of like when you're in a plane and they tell you that you have to put your face mask, oxygen mask on in an emergency before you put it on your child. Right. right. Because if you're not looking after yourself first, like how can you take care of others? And right. I right. think the real the real thing is there is is that aspect, but also the other aspect of where all of us have this huge list of things we should be doing. Right. <laughs> and so a lot of the time it's that extra layer of emotion that we add on top of ourselves that I'm not doing enough or um like this kind of a heaviness that we have because I have to do this or I should be doing that. And I think um, being aware of that and sometimes just saying to yourself that you, you're doing a great job and you've done enough can just take those emotional layers off um, and not have such a heaviness around your life. I think that's kind of the observations I've made with myself um, whenever I've got something hanging over my head of I should be doing this and I should be doing that and just taking a step back and kind of saying, hey, I'm doing a great job. And also a lot of the time when we want to make a change in something, it's such a trend to think that we have to do it all at once. Um, and I think that you can just make the tiniest small steps and just really develop that kind of a mentality where you uh, constantly giving yourself, uh, like rewarding yourself in a mental sense, like kind of saying, hey, that's great. Like you made that small shift. Like even if it's a tiny shift in healthy lifestyle or a tiny shift in looking after yourself, like if you're so, so busy and you can't think of like taking half an hour each day for yourself, like don't start with that much of a big task, you know, because it's going to overwhelm you. And Absolutely. so... Yeah, because a lot of it is a lot of it is we we want to make a change in some part of our lives. We realize how much is required. We get overwhelmed, and then that's where it keeps on getting pushed away. I'll do it when I blah blah blah. And the reason for this is because we've created this idea of how difficult the task is going to be. And the mental trick is to simplify. <laughs> is always to simplify and basically trick your brain into thinking it's easy. And the way you do that is just to break it down, break it down and start small. Um, and that way you can shift many areas of your life without feeling like it's a big job. <laughs> yeah, you have to run a mile before you can run 10, right? <laughs> Julie has a question here. Hang on one second. Pop it up here. Do you have any recommendations for people with PCOS? Yeah, excellent question. I myself struggled with uh, polycystic ovaries. So I didn't actually have the syndrome. So for those of you that don't know, PCOS is polycystic ovarian syndrome. I'm like trying to get my words in my head. Um, it's early in the morning in Australia, people. I know, very early. And the other thing is people were partying next door till like 1 o'clock in the morning, so forgive me. <laughs> um, but, yeah, so P PCOS for short is polycystic ovarian syndrome. So some people can have the syndrome, which means that when they have a blood test, their hormones are out of whack in addition to having the polycystic ovaries um, show up on an ultrasound. So right. I have the um the polycystic ovary show up on the ultrasound but my blood work was fine but I had a lot of the symptoms of the polycystic ovaries and so the syndrome is is everything so you've got the blood work the hormones are out of whack um so I think with anything 
it's important, again, to take a holistic approach because I've had lots of chronic issues such as gut, hormonal, um, you name it, like back issues. And looking back at my journey with overcoming all of them, I felt very overwhelmed with a lot of advice out there um, on what to do. And I think the best kind of information for you, besides like the practical tips that can be given, is to just remember that you're an individual and um, it can sometimes take a lot of trial and error to find out what works for you. The best thing for me that I think contributed the most with my polycystic ovaries was actually Chinese medicine and acupuncture, believe it or not. Um, I'm very much a fan of trying different um, ther natural therapies because um, not that I don't, like, believe in, I, I think it's important, you know, doctors have their place, but I'm much more um, a, looking at preventative measures. So, um, yeah, it's really important to look at different, different types of treatment. So for me, the Chinese medicine and acupuncture, I committed to nine months of acupuncture, which was quite a, a big, big thing. Um, to commit to that much, like, treatment. The cost is, you know, it's quite a significant investment. Um, but that changed my life, like, in terms of my hormonal health. I was also seeing a naturopath as well, uh, which helped. Um, and the good news is, is that my doctor wanted to put me on diabetic medication at the time, um, and I didn't because, of, of course, like, for those of you that don't know, the polycystic ovaries have a connection to insulin resistance. Um, so often people with PCOS get put on um, di diabetic medication and I managed to avoid having to do that through just changing my lifestyle, changing, um, going through the acupuncture and Chinese medicine. And so, yeah, I think though from, from an overall perspective, it's important to understand that each individual needs to look at themselves, not only what they're eating right. and how often they're exercising but their mental health as well and that changing your entire lifestyle just to overcome the PCOS can give you a lot of mental anguish <laughs> yeah yeah well and you know if and I know sometimes with that you know with insulin stuff you can have um you know the stress of it all can kind of you know it's almost like a vicious cycle where you know when you're having stress it increases your, your you know your syndrome but then having the syndrome increases your stress which then in turn keeps increasing you know all of the symptoms and blah 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 so it's like a vicious cycle mm -hmm. um i know that um oftentimes people are told you know in order to normalize your hormones in normal order to do these things for pcos um they're often suggested to go on a ketogenic diet mm -hmm. um yeah. so I, I, I have something to say about that. Okay. Um, I'm not against keto per se. I think with any type, type of diet, it, it's important to understand that there's going to be scientific evidence for and against it. And I think the problem with keto is a lot of people shove their, just one point of view onto people, not really understanding that scientific evidence if you're using it correctly, you're looking at the whole body of knowledge, not just one area. Um, and I think that's where a lot of people get um, swayed to believe certain things because they're the uh, people are very good at persuading. If they if they want to tell people to eat a certain way, um, they're very good at persuading them and using scientific evidence as a way to persuade. And I just think that it's it's misguided, mis misguided because um, if you're truly going to use scientific evidence, you need to understand the body of nutrition evidence and that there's not just a one-size-fits-all ever. Right. And so, um, yeah, and the other thing with keto, like how I was saying before, yes, like polycystic ovarian syndrome is connected to insulin, but if somebody's consuming a diet made up of 70% of their or 80% or whatever, like a really high carbohydrate diet, right? Or like let's say somebody's consuming a diet coming 70% of 
um, carbohydrates, right? And they're very processed carbohydrates. Um, and then they decide to go ketogenic, which is something like 5 to 10% carbohydrates. Right. I, it's right. not healthy to make such a jump. So you could get the same benefits just from lowering your carbohydrates by 10%. And then another 10% and maybe going down to 40 or 50% carbohydrates, you'll still get the same benefits that you get from lowering your carbohydrates, right? But you're not going to such an extreme. And I think that's that's the that's the biggest missing link with diets is that people go from one end to the other. And it's like you can be in between and still be healthy. Right. And And also, yeah. And then feel yeah. deprived. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So without feeling deprived and just switching up um, carbohydrates from processed to more um, less processed sources. Um, right. And not forgetting that vegetables are like the most healthiest food in the world and they are carbohydrates. So right. <laughs> exactly, exactly, exactly. Um, one other thing I wanted to touch on, I won't keep you all day because I know – I'm a total like nutrition, food, science, like geek. I love all this stuff. So I could sit and talk to Barbara all day about nutrition science. Um, But one thing that I found was very revealing for me as well as um, a little bit surprising is um, the emotional eating. At first I was like, oh, I'm not really an emotional eater. Like I don't get stressed out and then eat. I don't get, you know, like, and then I'm like, actually, I am an emotional eater. And then it's like, then I was able to kind of backtrack. Like for me, when I was having like an anxiety attack, I'd be like, I just need to take a break and I'm going to go to Starbucks and I'm going to get a cup of iced coffee. And then it was like, well, why is that my trigger food? Why was that my comfort thing? And, you know, so it took the work. I had to like sit down and think about it. And then I was like, oh, because when I was a kid, don't judge me or don't judge her, you guys. My grandmother used to let us drink iced coffee at her house. You know, I was like 12, right? 10 or 12, something like that. And it was kind of like a little special treat. But the it wasn't so much the iced coffee. Like, yeah, it was fantastic. And I still like iced coffee. But it was like, it was the way that it was given to us. Um, you know, it, it came from a place of love. Like, we made it together. And we had a fun time together. And, you know, the whole experience, like, even just thinking about it now, it, like, makes my heart happy. You know, like, so. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So that's how I kind of, you know, it's like, then I'll go have an iced coffee when I'm having like an anxiety attack. And it kind of like brings me back down a level, you know, and subconsciously, because I wasn't thinking about my grandmother every time that I was going to get an iced coffee, but something about it, you know, and maybe there's something in this in the caffeine as well, but something about it just brought me back down to earth a little bit and got me off that like anxiety edge. So that. For those of you guys who want to know what my emotional eating trigger was, it was iced coffee. And I still enjoy iced coffee from time to time, Um, not nearly as much. But um, that was something that Barbara actually helped me kind of reveal about myself. And and she didn't, like, force it. She just said, you know, think about these things here. Um, Julie says, preach, I eat my feelings. You probably hear that so much, Barbara, so much. Yeah, and I used to. (laughs) Like, like I'm tiny now but, and you probably don't can't tell, but I went through a lot of massive, massive struggles around food a mm-hmm. lot. And emotional eating was was one of my biggest things. Like it, anxiety. My big one was anxiety. Just any time I was anxious, give me something to eat. Like I right. could eat at any time of the day. I had no awareness of what full was. Like I don't know if anyone can relate, but no idea what does full even mean it's full like when I feel absolutely sick and I can't leave the house because my stomach is like (laughs) out here so yeah emotional eating um it can be very difficult mentally I think um especially when a person is trying to overcome emotional eating by dieting and it's it's really like trying to lose weight when you're an emotional eater is like trying to run a marathon with a broken leg like you have to heal the emotions first before you attempt losing weight. Um, right, because, right. That's a perfect analogy. Yeah, it's honestly like, please, like just knowing what I went through, you'll stay on that yo-yo of trying to lose weight forever because it's really sad. Like a lot of 
people are unaware of the mental health aspect of weight loss and how how often people have um, like emotions that that need to be addressed and worked on um, around their weight loss. Um, and I think that's really important for people to gain awareness of it. And you're so right. Like um, so many people aren't aware of it. Like I didn't understand it either. And the reason why is the, the science of it is that like even as a child, we're conditioned a certain way. And so we can be conditioned to eat more food um, when we're not hungry. So one of the biggest ones is like having to finish all your food off your plate, like in order to be a good girl, you know, right. eat all the food to be a good girl. And then you'll get dessert or you'll get dessert like if you're a good girl, you know, like and then there's this emotional connection to food. Right. Um, right. And so it's all about the way we've been conditioned right from childhood all the way up to even in adulthood we can we can be conditioned in new ways. And so our hunger can be conditioned to emotions. So instead of feeling an emotion, you feel hunger. And that's where people are unaware because they don't even experience the emotion. They're just experiencing right. hunger instead. And so right. it's, yeah, it's amazing when you uncover all this stuff about yourself. It just gives you a lot more power to be able to look after yourself in a holistic perspective, not just what you're eating. Right, right. No, I, I totally, totally, totally agree. And it's funny um, because I think so many people and their parents aren't trying to set them up for failure when they're telling them, you know, yeah. you have to eat all your dinner before you can have dessert. You know, they're just trying to be like, okay, you're not filling up on ice cream. You're going to eat your vegetables type of thing. Exactly, but yeah. The way that it's, it's done um, or a lot of people, um, I, I still sometimes hear like that they're, you know, like, Children don't leave the table until their plate is empty. And for me, like, I don't do that. Like, I don't do that with my kids only because I just am like, eat till you're full. And then if you're hungry, you can come back and finish this later. That's totally fine. Uh, because that's how I am sometimes. Like, I'm not, I sometimes serve myself more food than I want to eat by the time I get halfway done eating it. So, um, you know, and then just learning some of the different things kind of in relation to this and how we're, we're setting up those behaviors that, you know, we're training that, that type of behavior that, well, if it's on my plate, I have to eat it. Right. Mm -hmm. Instead of, you know, thinking about you go someplace like I'm going to pick on the olive garden here and they give you so much food. Like mm -hmm. there's no physical way I could eat an entire plate of food at the Olive Garden. And mm -hmm. that's not to say that you're not getting a great value. It's just more than one serving. So mm -hmm. for, with that, it's kind of like, then what? Like what if you're overserved in that way? It's hard to tell people like you have to finish that like before you can leave. Exactly. The table. You'll make yourself sick. Yeah, exactly. And like definitely just having – changing that belief where you have to eat everything and honoring your fullness because like you, the we're, we're, we're made to have an, an ability to manage our own weight like studying the biochemistry of the body and knowing understanding the biology of how we get full and how things happen like our body is so freaking smart like it's designed to know when we've had enough carbs fats and protein and we're done and we're full you know so there's so many different uh, mechanisms the body has to detect how much food food we've we've eaten not just the stretching of the stomach but other things yeah. and so if we tune into those messages that's like the fundamental key to managing your weight for life is to tune into those messages. But a lot of the time, if we're not listening, our brain has a filter. So it's just going to filter out things that we're not paying attention to, basically. So if we're not paying attention to that, um, that's where we fall prey to um, not being able to manage that um, aspect of eating and looking after ourselves. Um, so it can be quite a process to reconnect to that genuine hunger um and fullness but it's certainly possible and it and it's so so rewarding in many aspects of mental health and just overall health to follow those body signals um right. because our body signals are there for a reason 
Right, like when you crave certain things, you know, like a lot of people don't know that when they crave chocolate, they may be are magnesium deficient. You know, like so your body, your body does tell you the things. It's yeah. just knowing how to how to interpret what your body's saying, type of thing. Yeah, um, exactly. Or when you're craving orange juice, you probably or an orange probably need a little vitamin C, like yeah. those sorts of things. Um, we've got one more question here from Julie. Uh, like I said, I could keep Barbara here all day talking about <laughs> clients, but uh, she says, then what do you do with it? I know, I'm, I know I'm an emotional eater. How do you heal that? Good question. Yeah, great, great question, Julie. So with healing emotional eating, um, like I said, with anything, like with the polycystic ovaries as well, everything is always like, keeping in mind that I always use this analogy, like you're the captain of your own ship. Like you're going to have to take in information from every everywhere and then decipher it for yourself and figure out what's going to work for you because it's that connection between like that, that mind, body, soul kind of bringing all aspects of yourself together so that you're not only just following something but you're happy as well and you're you're taking learning and overcoming the issues at your own pace uh, because overcoming emotional eating can mean facing emotions and for me at the time when I was overcoming emotional eating the pain of facing my emotions was a lot because I'd never come face to face with them I'd always just bottled them up or um, covered them up and so for me like it was just taking my own pace at overcoming them. Um, so really, like, the, the key thing to understand with emotional eating, like I said, is that you're covering up emotions. You're afraid of them, so you're avoiding them by eating. So to truly overcome emotional eating, you have to become comfortable with being uncomfortable with your emotions. If that's kind of like a sum up of it, that's what it is. And because emotions aren't as scary as we make them out to be, it's actually the belief that they're scary that makes them scary. Um, right, right, so, right. Yeah, so the real key is it, it lies in, it's, all, it's mental from that perspective, but then there's always, you know, the other perspectives as well, like we were talking about, like you have to become more intuitive with your eating you have to listen to your body signals you have to be able to to distinguish between emotional hunger and real hunger right, and right. like you said as well before like the triggers like learning your triggers um slowing down the trigger slowing down the 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 pattern when you experience emotional hunger and and step by step each step knowing how to decipher why you're hungry in that moment like those are the key kind of in individual things that help overcome it um and then just something else which I might like to add that I find a lot of other emotional eating programs and books and stuff don't cover and that is the law of attraction and the importance of your identity and I kept on labeling myself as I am an emotional eater, which is fine, like to educate yourself and to learn about it. But then there comes a point where you've already learned what you need to do, but you're still bogged down by that identity and then creating a new identity and moving forward and saying, I am like just a normal person. Right. You know, right. and moving forward from that being bogged down with, I am a person with weight issues. I am a person with emotional eating. I am a person with PCOS, you know, and moving past those thoughts um, and reprogram reprogramming those thoughts and the mind to work with you so that you can right. move forward. Right. Yeah, that's really important as the kind of the final step and piece of the puzzle that I have to overcome. Would you recommend, Would you recommend somebody who is, maybe they're noticing like, okay, I'm totally craving a piece of chocolate cake or like for me, like I'm, a, I'm really having like some anxiety today. I really want that iced coffee or whatever. Would you then, I mean, for me, I can recognize and be like, you don't really want the iced coffee. You're having like a month, you know, so I can kind of like, right. Um, most, most, 
but mm -hmm. but would you recommend, would you recommend that somebody that who's in that in moment, that like, moment, okay, I recognize this is about to be like an emotional eating like disaster. I'm about to eat this whole chocolate cake or whatever it is, food, right? Um, um would you recommend instead of like, like, okay, okay, like, okay this is why I feel how I feel right, right now, and this and is what this is what happened to me. Like, is that part of would that be a good suggestion? Yeah, definitely. So a lot of the time in the moment. When I'm feeling a particular emotion, um, I would ask myself why, why I'm feeling the particular emotion. When you ask yourself that question, when you prompt yourself that question, if you want to journal about it, you're going to start journaling about the thoughts that and the beliefs that are leading to that emotion. Okay, and perfect. so with emotional eating, you could ask yourself, how am I feeling, first of all? from an emotional sense, not the hunger or the what, whatever. How am I feeling? Like, am I upset about something? Am I anxious or am I happy? You know, what am I feeling? Um, and then diving deeper and then the next layer of what's the emotion, what are my particular beliefs, et cetera, et cetera. There's one more thing that I want to add with this is okay. that if you're like eating the whole chocolate cake and then you're telling yourself, not to eat the whole chocolate cake. It's going to be difficult to go from somebody who's an emotional eater a lot of the time to not being an emotional eater. Like anything, it needs to be a gradual process. Um, otherwise, your body's not going to be able to adjust from having like a larger amount of like sweet foods to a smaller amount of sweet foods. Also, just because of the, the chemicals involved in the brain, um, it's kind of like giving up a drug, I guess. <laughs> like, right. Kind of like um, if you're giving up smoking, like you'll switch to nicotine packages or something like that. Like for me, one of the biggest things that helped me was saying, okay, you can have chocolate cake, Barbara, because one of my big triggers was mud cake. And it's funny because I don't even eat mud cake anymore. But I used to sit in my car and eat mud cake with my fingers. <laughs> I'm not even, and I ate it in my car because I was ashamed of eating it in front of other people. Right. And so right. I eat mud cake in the car with my fingers. And so one of the first steps for me, besides all that emotional stuff, besides all the journaling and all that, was to actually say to myself, Barbara, you can have chocolate cake. And then I kind of designated a time where I allowed myself a piece of chocolate cake and a certain amount. Um, whereby I didn't feel deprived, keep on saying to myself, you can't have the chocolate cake, you can't have the chocolate cake, because then it would just turn All you think about it. <laughs> yeah. And then it would last for like two weeks and then I'd be in the car and I'd be eating chocolate cake with my fingers and going, what the hell am I doing? <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> and then, and then, then the guilt comes and then it just, it, once that guilt comes in and you're like, well, all my hard work is down the drain right now, then it perpetuates you into like a, a downward spiral instead of just being like, I'm having this chocolate cake. It's on the calendar for Friday and I'm yeah. going to love it. And it feels so good. And it's so amazing. And then tomorrow I'm going to have vegetables for breakfast again, and back to the daily grind or whatever, you know, whatever your, your normal way of eating is. Um, and I think that's, a, that's a hard, hard like lesson to, to adapt into your reality that like, because we're so trained, and I don't know where the training comes from. I don't know if it's, you know, from just society or whatever, but you're so trained that it's like, this cake is bad. This is bad. bad. So you have it, you're bad. And, you know, when you quit your diet, you're bad. And so we beat ourselves up over these things. And and then we're, we're putting ourselves in this never-ending circle of, you know, it's definitely not a circle of self-love self -love and, you know, eating because you love yourself. It's like, oh, I love myself and it's guilty and it's, you know, so that's so that never-ending never cycle and then no you diet and everything else. Um, uh, Julie says, I, I in front of other people. Yeah, I definitely, um, yeah, the whole thing with, being ashamed around food, um, feeling guilty, all of these emotions unfortunately just perpetuate the cycle of feeling bad about yourself or feeling bad in general and then having to eat more to feel better um, mm -hmm. because emotional eating at the core is that you're trying to make yourself feel better. 
And as much as you're trying to blame yourself, it's actually just your body trying to take care of you. Um, so one of the first things is to just have a bit of compassion towards yourself. Hey, like this isn't a bad thing. I'm. This is just my natural body's ability to try and look after me. Like that's all it wants at the end of the day is just to feel good. Um, and so by turning towards food, it's trying to look after you really. <laughs> And I like, see how I'm kind of talking about the body in a separate sense um, because it's important to understand that your body isn't you. Um, it's just really kind of like the the holder of your spirit right now, you know. So it's important to understand like your body is kind of separate in that sense. It's, it's trying to look after you in the only way it knows how in that moment. So you just have to show it uh, different ways. Um, and anything to do with guilt, um, ashamed, and these are all relationship to food. That's what we're talking about when we're talking uh, about the term relationship to food. It's getting rid of the, that. I mean, getting rid of, I guess, managing guilt and feeling ashamed about eating, things like that. Um, because having a good relationship with food is actually – more an indicator of health than just eating healthy. Um, it's, right, that's right, what I mean right. by the, that whole holistic perspective. Um, so definitely guilt, feeling ashamed, all these things, they actually just perpetuate the cycle of, an emotion, of emotional eating and making it worse. Um, and that's why I think a lot of women unknowingly gain weight after dieting and yo-yo dieting um, because of of those feelings. Right, right. Um, what about um, feeling like people are watching you when you eat? Yeah, so that um, feeling like people are watching you when you eat really comes down to the, the beliefs that people have about themselves. Um, so if, if there's an overall anxiety around food and people watching, then I'm guessing there's some sort of a prediction. The brain is making a prediction that people are thinking you shouldn't be eating that or you look a certain way, therefore you shouldn't eat that. Or there's a part of the brain that's predicting what other people are thinking right? and right. Then taking that as reality. Um, also there's that aspect of like um, not feeling like perhaps deserving of food. Um, so there's a lot of different things to look at to break down those particular emotions and anxiety around food and then you can overcome those uh, issues and circumstances around food. But definitely there, with those type of issues, there's there's a part of the brain that's predicting that people are watching you because if, if um, yeah, if there's that fear of people are watching me, there's a fear of people judging, right? Right. Uh, and it's that imagination, our part of the brain. I call it the inner drama queen sometimes. It's like pre predicting a catastrophe, right? It's predicting the worst situation. And then your imagination is literally playing out that scenario in your head, making life seem unbearable. Right. So then you can't cope with eating in front of other in front of other people because your imagination is creating this thing where everybody's judging you. And, and then it can perpetuate if they actually do judge you, you know, and say something. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah, which happened to me actually, believe it or not. Um, you know, when I was first starting to explore my ability to eat different foods, um, I was eating an ice cream at work and one of the girls instantly said, I thought you were trying to lose weight. Why are you eating that? And I was just luckily at that point I had learnt to block other people out and I was like, actually, I can eat this and still lose weight. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's yeah, it's it's totally possible to overcome those things and you will be healthier and happier as a result. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I think the biggest thing is, you know, it's kind of like anything else, you know, like the first thing is admitting that like, okay, like – I do, I do have an emotional attachment to food, like kind of just owning it, and then identifying what those triggers could be, whether it's on the emotional side, like, knowing too, like, okay, like for me, my 
my anxiety go to was iced coffee. Ice coffee. And, um, and then so then I would start instead of getting the gigantic one, I would get like a smaller one. So I, I was reminding myself of that. Exactly. that. Yeah, less of it, and therefore less calories and all that other good stuff. Yeah. So instead of having the whole thing, exactly or a cupcake. <laughs> yeah, exactly, and it's the same with any food. Like, um, you know, instead of eating the whole pizza, like have three slices. You know, whatever food, like you don't have to cut anything out. Like that. That's the beauty of it. Um, and also managing all those emotions and things like that like on top of it is so right. so important just for overall health and well-being like mental health is such a huge part of overall health <laughs> yeah yeah and i think too like even outside of like the weight loss aspect of it cuz like that's obviously like a huge bonus but once you're able to like face those emotions head on then you kind of are like, okay, you don't control me anymore emotions. I control you. And I think from a mental health like standpoint, like being in control of your, your own self is a huge stride, even bigger than the weight loss thing. Like, so I said like the weight loss part of it is a huge bonus, but being able to be in control of your own life is huge. Huge, huge. Like, Definitely. I think the biggest thing that I've gained out of my journey with the whole dieting, emotional eating and all of that stuff was definitely just coming out as a person that felt empowered. That's kind of how I feel. I feel empowered because I know that I am in charge of what goes on in my life. And that's an amazing feeling to have. Um, to not feel like you're the victim of your life or the victim of your emotions and how you're right. feeling. Um, and my, I used to have depression every single year, and I don't get that anymore. Oh, nice. nice. Yeah. Good. That's, see, and so that I feel like, you know, like for you, you can eat whatever you want, and you learn to make um, more educated decisions on the things that you do actually eat, you know, like, so, I mean, obviously, it's like you can't have, like, a box of hamburger helper every single meal and think that that's healthy eating. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, all these food people are probably, like, going to throw rocks at me or something one day because I'm talking about how they're not actually healthy foods. But the point is, is it's a processed food. And so you can't actually eat that every day and then have the expectation that something's going to change or that it's a he- considered a healthy food. So... I think part of the whole process is encompassing that one, you have to educate yourself on the emotions. You have to educate yourself on your triggers and you have to educate yourself on what's really in the things that you're eating. You know, like, is it whole foods? Is it, um, is it processed? You know, like just knowing the difference in that. And I know that um, in your no diet babe program that you do talk about, you know, how to make better decisions when you're making food decisions. You know what I mean? And, um, and so I guess my point is, is like, yes, you can still have the ice cream. Yes, you can still have the cake, but you can't have it for every meal for every day. Like you still have to eat nourishing foods and things that come out of a box aren't typically nourishing. That's the point I was trying to make. <laughs> Absolutely. People have this misconception about intuitive eating where you're just eating junk food all the time. But a true intuitive eater is looking at and understanding that if you're craving like pints of ice cream every day, that's emotional. That's not intuitive eating. That's emotional eating. And so like really understanding that like I'll crave vegetables, (laughs) Like I literally crave vegetables and if I'm not getting enough vegetables, I I can't function and I would feel absolutely sick like eating junk food all the time or eating um, like, for example, pizza or burgers or whatever every single day. Um, And that's because when you actually truly connect to the body, um, it's not just that connection mentally but also just having an awareness of how your body's reacting to certain things. So like if you're feeling lethargic and tired or whatever, like 
there's certain signals that your body's giving you. And if you're intuitive and aware of those things, then you can decipher, you know, what you need to change in your diet. And I think you would agree with this too, um, that like you were saying before about the marketing of foods and things like that, the biggest thing that people don't understand is just to read the label and look at the ingredients of something uh, because that's a true representation of, of that food. And to also just understand that a lot of labelling too doesn't truly give us information on how that food was processed. Um, so it, it can be so confusing in terms of what healthy eating is. And um, a lot of the people out there educating on healthy eating are making overgeneralizations um, that are just not really focusing on the fact that food is healthy when it's closest to, to its like natural natural source. Right, like and, an apple doesn't have a nutrition label because it's just an apple. Exactly. Yeah, and so that's healthy eating, like when something is just whole food you know and um yeah so I think that's kind of the most important thing and the confusion with healthy eating because uh people are somewhat led to believe you know that carbs are unhealthy or like there's so many over generalizations you know and it's it's much more in-depth and complex than that um and it's more of an individual thing as well yeah absolutely absolutely I love that um, so we have been on for a, almost an hour now, which I'm super excited about. Like I said, I could totally like talk about I'm this. Whatever all day. I told you. <laughs> but I want to make sure that you guys know that Barbara has an amazing gift for us and I posted it in the comments above. So make sure you take advantage of that. And, um, do you want to tell them a little bit about what is, what the gift actually is? Yeah, sure. So it's access to um, like a little library that I have on my website. So one of the great things about this library, um, one of my favorite things, uh, like I've got two trainings on there. So if you click on um, the library section, there's a training there on kind of where I kind of decipher all these emotional eating things, how to actually tell if you're an emotional eater. So if you're having some confusion over whether or not you're an emotional eater, you can check out that training. Also, that because the training has several videos, there's three videos within that one training. And I also talk about um, weight loss and how, you know, how to decipher your different goals and beliefs around weight loss, um, which I think is really that first step in um, truly moving forward with your goals. Yeah. Um, and then I've got actually another video, which is really, really great on how to overcome emotional eating. So I go in a lot more depth about the triggers that we were talking about today. So I actually go into quite a bit of depth with my free content because I, as you can see, I just love talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> and then I've just got like a couple of little, um, also some, some, sh some information, um, like little mini eBooks. Um, one which is really great, which I talk about why eating less doesn't necessarily make you weigh less. Um, so I talk about um, the science behind your metabolism, things like that. So it's kind of like an introductory into the type of things that you would learn in the No Diet Babe Academy. Um, so it's a mixture of psychology, um, like law of attraction, manifesting, um, intuitive eating. I've got tons of just basic nutrition science in there, like loads of stuff. And so that free content as well, like you're going to get a great introduction into a lot of those things that we've talked about today. That is, that like, is like so generous. So generous. Okay, so, okay, so you guys make you guys sure make sure you check that out because, because I, I, there is so much so value, value in, in this free gift free that gift that you request. But, um, um, so, so we're going to go ahead and wrap, wrap because, because like I said, like, it's like first, first thing in the morning, in the morning tomorrow, <laughs> and, I, and, uh, and uh, I can hear my little kid like, banging on the door. So, <laughs> no, I didn't walk them out. They're out there with their dad. So, <laughs> um, but this was such a great interview. I am so excited that I got to connect because we had so we have such crazy time zone difference. Um, <laughs> So grateful that you decided to join us and share so so much with us like so much 
Thank you so much for having me. I've loved it. And yeah, I just love spreading this message, just helping women. I absolutely love it. So thank you yes. so much for having it's me. It's my pleasure. It's my pleasure. <laughs> okay, everybody, make sure that you click the link above, get Barbara's, you know, it sounds like a pretty substantial library. Um, make sure you check that out because if weight loss and emotional eating and all of the things that are holding you back, the yo-yo diets, if that's something that's like something that's like consuming your life pretty much, make sure you check it out so you don't have to be consumed by your dieting and you can take control of your emotions, you can take control of your life, and you can take control of your weight. So that's it. <laughs> Talk to you guys later. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Bye.